Hi, I'm Zach Woldirk, one of the research scientists at Faunalytics. Uh, we're an animal advocacy nonprofit that focuses on building capacity in the movement. Some of the ways we do that uh, is through our research library, which provides accessible summaries of research that might be relevant to animal advocates, and through our pro bono support, like our weekly office hours. But one of the main things we do is conduct our own research, and I'm going to be talking about our newest study in that line today. Uh, different strokes for different folks comparing U.S. groups' openness to animal pro-animal actions. First, I'm going to give a short overview of the study, and then I'll do a quick walkthrough of our interactive results graphing tool, which is designed to make it easier for advocates to find the results that are most relevant to their work. So what's the study about? Well, we know that different people are open to different things. What's appealing to one person might not be appealing to another person. Advocates working on outreach know this especially well. So for example, uh, imagine an advocate is on a college campus asking people to commit to going vegan. Some people might be willing to consider it or at least consider cutting back on the amount of animal products they're eating. But of course, a lot of people won't even entertain the thought. They're pretty resistant to pro-animal diet changes. So. Are they a lost cause? Is there no point in asking them to take action to help animals? Of course not. It's possible that there are other pro-animal actions they would take, maybe signing a petition aimed at getting better conditions for farmed animals, or even just purchasing a meat alternative like a Beyond Burger. Uh, but it's not practical for advocates to run through a list of a dozen pro-animal actions to see if they can get the person to say yes to some of them. Um, instead, wouldn't it be helpful if the advocate could consider their audience, which in this example probably includes a lot of students since they're on a college campus, my cat saying hi, uh, and prioritize asks that their audience is most likely to say yes to. Uh, that's where this study comes in. We wanted to know how different groups of people felt about a variety of different pro-animal actions so that advocates working with certain groups of people could tailor their asks to those groups. Most of the research that's been done in this area has asked people about one or two actions like going vegan or, or voting for a ballot measure to improve farmed animals conditions. Um, that research also has often focused on only a few characteristics like gender or age, and that's all really useful information. But we wanted to expand the amount of data available to advocates, so we surveyed 6,000 people across the US and asked them how open they were to 18 different pro-animal actions. And we also have about 20 different participant characteristics to explore the results by. So in addition to asking people if they'd go vegan or vote for a ballot measure, we also asked about things like cutting out certain animal products, buying cruelty-free products, supporting meatless Mondays in schools. Uh, and then in addition to breakdowns of the results by gender and age, we have information on differences by race and ethnicity, whether there are kids in the household, if someone's a companion animal guardian, what their political beliefs are, what part of the country they live in, uh, and a lot of other things. So that survey provided us with a lot of data and a lot of interesting results, but I wanted to highlight a few of our key findings. Um, first, the groups of people who are most likely and least likely to take pro-animal actions, they're often divided along political lines. So for example, uh, almost 85% of Democrats said that they would vote for a ballot measure aimed at improving conditions for farmed animals, uh, compared to only 56% of Republicans. Um, and that's similar numbers for, for liberals versus conservatives. Um, but it's not just party lines or, or those more traditional political lines. Uh, there's also big gaps between people who are concerned about climate change and people who aren't. So any issue that is sort of politicized might might be a, a sort of proxy for how people might uh, feel about certain pro-animal actions. Um, the next finding that I wanted to touch on is that people are most open to simple actions that result in institutional change. Across nearly every group we surveyed, the actions people were most open to were voting for a ballot measure aimed uh, at improving conditions for farmed animals, signing a petition designed to improve farmed animal welfare, and supporting meatless Mondays in schools. Overall, more than 60% of the US public was open to each one of those actions. And the last key finding that I wanted to highlight uh, is that people who are Black, Indigenous, and people of the global majority are often more open to pro-animal actions than white people. Uh, but the degree of openness depends on the specific action. So for one example, 
veganism and animal advocacy more generally are often thought of as a very white movement. Uh, but in our survey, Black participants reported the highest likelihoods of going vegan, of going pescatarian, uh, of removing beef and pork from their diets. And at the same time, Black participants weren't always among the groups most open to non-diet actions, which kind of underscores the importance of considering your audience. Um, just because one action is popular doesn't mean another action will be. And now I, I want to touch on just a couple of recommendations we have for advocates. Um, first, if you know who your audience is, tailor your ask to your audience. Or on the on the other hand, if you're trying to decide who to reach out to, focus on the groups who are most open to your asks. So one way to do either of those things is to use the results graphing tool that I'm going to show you in a few minutes. Uh, but something that I think is really important to mention here is to make sure that outreach efforts are led by members of the community that's being reached out to. So a study like this one that kind of hinges on group differences is kind of inevitably going to encourage advocates to sort of target certain groups on the basis of visible characteristics. And obviously that approach can result in harm if it's not done thoughtfully. So uh, we go into more detail about this in our report, which I would definitely recommend checking out, especially on this point. Um, but again, outreach to specific communities should be led by members of those communities. Two other recommendations I wanted to highlight are that advocates should prioritize ballot measures like Prop 12 in California, which was recently upheld by the Supreme Court. And uh, nearly every group we, we surveyed said the action that they were most open to taking is voting for ballot measures to improve farmed animals' conditions. So advocates might have a lot of success if they're able to get initiatives like that on the ballot. Um, people who believe in climate change uh, or believe that it's a very serious problem, I should say, were also consistently among the most likely to take pro-animal actions. And because of that, there are probably pretty good opportunities for collaboration between animal and environmental advocacy groups, which, by the way, is something that Faunalytics is, is currently exploring in some of our other research. Um, and then a couple of other recommendations that you can read more about in our report uh, are pushing for clearer, more meaningful, quote-unquote, humane labeling, uh, as well as combining the tractability numbers from this study with estimates of the number of animals affected by certain actions to evaluate the relative impact of different advocacy approaches. So, as you might have guessed, this research produced a lot of information. We know that not everybody wants to scroll through a report to find the information that's most relevant to them. Because of that, we created an interactive results graphing tool to make it quicker and easier to find the results that are most relevant to your work. So I'm gonna share my screen now and do a quick walkthrough of that tool. Um, and I should say, uh, you can access this tool from the link that uh, Jenna is going to, or maybe already has uh, provided. Um, and um, you can also, if you'd prefer, access it through the, uh, the Faunalytics website. So one second to share my screen here. Okay, great. So hopefully you all can see that. Um, all right. Um, and also, uh, please let me know in the comments, <clears throat> excuse me, if there's an example I can run for you. Uh, and I can do that while we're live here. Uh, also, feel free to ask any questions you might have uh, in the comments. So um, after closing the little instructions pop up that comes up here, the first thing that you're going to see is a graph. And this is a breakdown of how likely each age group is to remove beef and pork from their diet in the next year. And you can see that, for example, 21% of people 18 to 24 said that they were likely to make this change compared to only 14% of people over the age of 55. And this is just one example of what the results might look like. Um, if you wanna see the results a little bit differently, you can take a look here at the left side of the screen where um, you have a, a variety of display options. So starting from the top, we have graph display options. Right now, we're able to compare different participant characteristics for a single selected action. Um, then we have this drop down here with all of the actions we asked about. So you can scroll through here and see some of the some of the things that we asked about. Um, let's see the results for buying a meat substitute in the next year. 
again, you can see that uh, participants over the age of 55 were a bit less likely than other participants uh, to take this action. So far, we've just looked at age. What does that look like for other characteristics? Um, so we can unselect age here and then say we want to look at people who live in rural versus urban areas or people who have children in the household. So here on the left, you can see 39% and 39%. It's about 40% for, for both people with and without children in the home saying that they would buy uh, a meat substitute. Um, so doesn't seem to be a, a huge difference there. Um, however, only 32% of people in rural areas said that they would buy a meat substitute compared to 40% of people in urban areas. So this lets us see that, at least for that action, some characteristics appear to matter, uh, while others don't matter as much. But what if you wanted to, you know, what if you work with a, a specific group of people, say uh, people who live in the South, uh, and you want to see which actions people are most open to there? Well, you can switch the display option up here at the top to compare different actions. And then you can select the characteristic that you're interested in. In this case, uh, we're going to be looking at regions uh, of the US. And here you can unselect or select which which regions you're interested in. But for the for this example, let's just leave them all selected. Um, and you can also select then a few actions that you might be interested in. Let's say going vegetarian, uh, ordering a, a vegetarian or vegan entree at a restaurant, and donating to a farmed animal advocacy organization. So here we can see that people in the South, which is the blue bar, are slightly more likely to make a donation to a farmed animal advocacy organization than people in the Midwest, uh, which is this like whiter bar. Um, but they're still a little bit less likely, or sorry, uh, to, yeah, to, to go vegetarian over here um, compared to people in the mid Midwest even. But these numbers are all very close, so it's probably about the same kind of uh, uh, across, across all the regions. Um, if we look at ordering a, a vegetarian entree uh, at a restaurant in the next year, you'll see that people in the South, this blue bar again, are a little bit less likely than people in the Northeast, the green bar, people in the West, the sort of purple bar, um, but just slightly more likely than people in the Midwest. Um, so just one example of, of what we can sort of take out of this out of this graph and advocates can kind of see that, you know, maybe for going vegetarian, it doesn't really matter too much um, what part of the country people are from. Um, but maybe something like uh, donating to a farmed animal advocacy organization, maybe there is a slight difference there. Um, so just something something to keep in mind. Um, if you happen to be interested in adding confidence intervals to these figures, you can show them by toggling them off here or on and off here. Um, so confidence intervals added confidence intervals taken away. And if you want to see more detailed results in a, in a table, um, you can do that as well by toggling the results table on. By doing that, you'll see a little table gets added below the results here that has has the results um, in a more detailed table form. Um, so uh, in addition to our results tab and an instructions tab, which is just the same thing as the pop-up at the beginning there, um, we also have a methodology tab that explains how we got this data, what exact questions participants were asked, um, and a bunch of other information if you're interested in that. So now I just want to I just want to check and see um, if we got any questions. Um, oh, and I see one in here that says, uh, "I'm curious to see the difference between people living in rural versus urban areas and their support for farmed animal welfare. Could you show how likely?" urban versus rural people are to vote for farmed animal welfare measures and for candidates who support these causes. Um, absolutely, we can take a look at that. So to do that, uh, and that's a really great question, um, we can take a look at the results for that combination of characteristic and question by selecting rural and urban as our characteristic of interest here. And then uh, we want to take a look at I believe uh, vote for a ballot measure focused on farmed animal welfare and vote for a political candidate based on farmed animal welfare stances. So looking at the results here, um, I'm gonna turn this table off. Um, so we can see uh, in rural is the lighter of the two bars, urban is the darker. Um, in both cases, 
members of the U.S. public who live in rural areas are just a little less likely than uh, urban residents to vote for a political candidate based on their farmed animal welfare stances and to vote for uh, farmed animal welfare focused ballot measure. Um, however, that's a pretty small difference. It's three percentage points here, four percentage points here. Um, and and that's kind of actually surprising to me, at least on, on first glance, um, considering that rural residents probably are more likely to have connections to the animal agriculture industry than urban residents. So that's that would drive this number down a little bit, um, but it's not it's not all that much lower. So what this suggests to me is that advocates working in rural areas might be able to have a fair amount of success at the ballot box, even though we might expect it to be more of an uphill battle in those parts of the country. Um, obviously, the animal agriculture industry will mobilize to work against those pro-animal actions, but I think the the baseline level of support is pretty high. Um, almost half the people say that they would vote for a candidate based on their farmed animal welfare stances, and 70% say that they would vote for a ballot measure like a, like a Prop 12. Um, and that's a pretty good starting point. Uh, if you ask me. Um, so thanks for that really great question. Um, hopefully that was a helpful way of illustrating how you can use this tool. Um, and before we wrap up, um, I'm going to stop sharing my screen, actually. Before we wrap up, one thing you might have noticed in, in this report and with the graphing tool uh, is that we're focusing on one characteristic at a time. So age, for example. We're going to be doing some follow-up research using this data to look at combinations of characteristics that we'll be publishing uh, in an upcoming blog post. And we want to know if there are any groups uh, that combine two of our characteristics that you're particularly interested in. So for example, combining gender and age to look at the results for young men, or combining political beliefs and income to look at conservatives with high household incomes. So leave us a comment to let us know which groups you're interested in. Um, if something comes to you a little later and you're interested in submitting a subgroup that we can include in that companion blog post coming out in June, or if you think of a question about this study, uh, please reach out to either uh, to us either by sending an email to info at faunalytics.org, uh, visiting my office hours on Wednesdays, or sending us a direct message here. Thank you.